Tom Clancy, one of the best-selling authors of our time, he has virtually created the genre of the techno-thriller. His books have crossed over into film, television, even video games. And the success of films like The Hunt for Red October and Clear and Present Danger have made movie producers awaiting his next book as eagerly as readers. But he remains devoted to the craft of writing. He has spent the last two years working on his latest book. It is called Rainbow Six. It picks up with the character of John Clark. I am pleased to have Tom Clancy back at this table. Welcome back. Well, nice to be back, Charlie. It's good to have you. You've been working on it for how long? Well, I wrote the book in about four and a half months, I guess, yes. as usual. Uh, started working on it uh, at the end of December of last year just, and finished it in uh, early May. Yeah, why back to John Clark? I, mean, I just felt like the thing to do. Yeah. It was the book I wanted to write this year. Yeah. And why was that? It just felt like it. You know, yeah. some, you know, why did I pick a five iron instead of a six iron? You know, it's just it's the right iron. You know, what what felt right about it though? What felt right uh, to, to talk about to write like, a story? It just a, seemed a like a fun subject. You know, uh, yeah. you know, John's running a, a group called Rainbow. It's right. a, a NATO multinational counterterror team, and that's sort of a job for John. Uh, John is sixty. Uh, he's in his middle fifties now, I guess. Yeah. He's how is he different from Jack Ryan? Well, you know, John has always been Ryan's dark side. He's the guy who who does things that Ryan would prefer not to do. He's, yeah. Ron is he, more academic, he's more action. Uh, yeah, he's the guy who goes out in the field and gets his hands dirty. Yeah. What else? He kills people. What else? And he's smart. You don't set out with the end in mind. I mean, you, in a sense, let not the exactly, story no. take over. There's yeah. no perfect outline in which you finish chapter I never by chapter. do outlines. No, no it's not like a, a storyboard that you already have in no. your mind mm -hmm. wrapped up several times around your office. Nope. So how did how does that happen then? I mean, you just give them give them wheels and they you just go tell running. The, you tell the story, and the, and the story has a natural beginning, middle, and end. But but today, you know, when you're writing this, today you get up one morning, and and you don't know, or you have some idea of where that character is going to do that day, or you have a rough idea, but not not always a precise one. So what tells you about the twist and turns of action? The characters. The more you indulge, you know, involve yourself within their. You, know, you let your characters do your thinking for you. The idea of of setting up the plot for these because of the way you tie so many you lay something going here and something out here and something out here mm -hmm. and it's all going to connect and you know where does that come from? I really don't know, but as long as it stays, I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. You know, you it's, it's what I do. It's my job, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes you, doing a job is a lot easier than explaining it. Are you better? Do you feel more comfortable doing it today? Then does each novel get easier, more interesting? No, they don't. And and the reason is uh, your expectations seem to always race ahead of your abilities. I mean, the more you do something, the better you get at it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm a better writer today than I was ten years ago. Yeah. But your expectations keep going a little bit faster. You're always you're always in competition with yourself. What do you know because of your interest in most things military about this idea of? Um, the Russians not knowing where all the bombs are. First of all, I don't think it's true. I mean, you I'm, think they know where they, they all are? They must know. Right. I mean, you, 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 these, you don't mislay a nuclear device. That's that's number one. Well, it's a lot of. And number two, the the, the uh, back in the 1970s, we have this thing on all our nuclear nuclear devices called PALs, permissible action links. It's a safety system that goes on the, on the weapon. And back in the 1970s, the United States government did something very intelligent. We gave our PAL technology to the Russians. So that their nukes would be as so safe as our nukes, yeah. and uh, I'm reliably informed that cracking through a PAL is not a not a trivial exercise. And what, as a guy once told me, so you got to be really smart and really lucky not to get killed. So if some some general who's pissed off because of the way things are, if some general says, "I'm not happy about the way this government is treating me," he and cannot, other he officers cannot just no the way, weapon, and he can't take the weapon apart. Neither. Neither. So only Yeltsin has the sort of black box, or pe the people close around them, you know, who have the activation codes. You know, what interests you about the military landscape today? Today, yeah. well, same thing. It's, you know, they've still got the nicest toys, and they're still instruments of national policy. When when the president picks up the phone and says we have to do something today, they're the people who have to go do it. And how good are, is our army today, and our air force, and it's our the navy, and our marines, and our seals? You talk about Clark being an ex-seal. They're the best in the world. 
Are they really? Uh, by the far. best fighting because of their weapons or because of their training or Both. because of their something else? Weapons and training. Really? Now, I mean, we're not spending as much money on training today as we used to, and that's a little worrisome, but they're still the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And do we have the best strategists, the best generals, the best... The people we have are awfully good, but that's a case where the proof of the pudding's in the eating, and you don't really know for sure until you're, until you're in a shooting war. And what did we find out in the Gulf? In, in, uh, in, in 1991, we found out they were pretty good, but those, those guys are just about all retired now. now. The senior commanders, Freddie Franks is gone, you know, Schwarzkopf is retired, Colin Powell's retired. Uh, but, you know, the guys... Waller's retired. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, but, you know, the people they trained are now in those jobs, and, and you have a continuity of, of, of skill and education. These are good people. Uh, are they absolutely the best in the world? You don't know for sure, they're, but they're they're probably plenty good enough. How about Shelton? You know General Shelton? Uh, I never met him. He has a hell of a service reputation, yeah. though. He's a terrific guy. Yeah. A North Carolinian. He went to UNC, didn't he? I think he went to State, North Carolina State. Oh, okay. You know, and then went on to you know throw that sort of and he's superb a lot, education. He's a lot of good recipes for snake over an open fire. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, he is one of those people who seem to have performed magnificently in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, was not a, a desk jockey. Oh, he's a very a, serious professional soldier and king of the snake eaters, so... Uh, what does that mean, king of the snake eaters? Uh, the snake eaters, they're, they're, the, the, the snake eater is a term they use for people in special operations. Yeah, and that's things like uh, the Green Berets or things like sne Se seals, seals or... Seals, they all eat snakes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they call them snake eaters? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I've asked you this before. I mean, tell me who your heroes are. Oh, God, there's lots of them. We, we, well, we live in a society that's awash with heroes. Uh, physicians, guys who battle with life and death issues every day. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of stuff with the faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, uh, and I'm talking world-class intellects, and they're, they're, they battle with death on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. They're heroes. Uh, cops, firemen, you know, firemen, what's, what's a fireman do? He runs into a burning building to save people he doesn't even know. That's heroic. A cop answering a silent alarm, that's heroic. You know, we live in a society where there's lots of people who, who do their work every day, and for the most part, we don't think about them except when we need them, and then, and then we, get, we get their respect, we give them the respect they deserve. Uh, maybe not as much as we ought to. Unfortunately, the media very often ignores them. We had those, you know, last week we had those two cops killed in, 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 on Capitol Hill, and... and, and, and the media we, didn't ignore that, for goodness sakes. I've never seen no, so I mean, much attention from the story. They, they, they sort of made, it, tried, they made up for all the other cops they ignored. Uh, covering those guys, which is fine. But what about you know? What about all the city cops in, in New York or Baltimore or Chicago yeah, I, I, or St. On Louis? On this point, I beg to differ because uh, because it is such a good story. I think for newspapers. I mean, if you look at the Daily News and the New York, they put those stories on the front page all the time. And the firemen. heroism of those people because it sells newspapers and it's a good story. So they're there all the time. Well, in a city like New York, yeah, what, you know, St. Louis, Phoenix, Arizona. I mean, different places. I'm not sure that they always get the respect they deserve. Why don't you write about, I mean, if you're interested in medicine, if you're interested in, in, say, these other areas, is it because, why not write beyond the military? Well, beyond I did, in executive orders, there was a major medical subplot, uh, yeah. which I put in there. Can you imagine doing a story that does not have a military base? I mean, that's venturing off the reservation for you. It's possible. Cardinal, Cardinal of the Kremlin had very little of that. Yeah. And so did pa Patriot Games didn't have very much. I mean, it, but you, you, you fit the pieces into the story. Without remorse, is going to be made into a movie at some point? I sure hope so. We haven't made a deal on it yet. It's the one you like, isn't it? Mm. It's one of the books I like a lot, you know. <laughs> Why is that? Oh, I, I got, it's a book in which I got to be bad. I mean, the hero is a serial killer who tortures people. Uh, I broke every rule there was in the business then, and I got away with it. That's kind of fun. When you, when you think about this, I mean, what are the, look at this picture here, I mean, is that looks like General Clancy. Oh, uh, it's me uh, pretending uh, to be an aviator yeah, wearing a, uh, yeah. a flight suit. Gazing my, out into the wild blue yonder. It looks like, are you standing on a, on a... I'm standing on my own property overlooking the Chesapeake Bay. Oh, I see. And who took the, some... Oh, uh, some, yeah, some photographer came a few years ago. Down, yeah. um, can you imagine not writing novels? I mean, what you might do if you didn't write? Well, I can't turn into a professional golfer because I'm not good enough. Do you uh, like golf, though? I, I like golf, but I do X-rated golf. Yeah. X-rated meaning what? I mean, it's crummy. <laughs> oh, I see. It's, it's not something you want to see. No, it's, it's not one of, pretty. One of, one of the great terrors of my life is playing golf in public and you know, having people, you know, cover me and, and, and commentary, you know, 
well, Mr. Clancy's elected not to play this ball and we'll play, take another shot. You know, and I understand that we flubbed up the first one. Yeah. When you look at today's crisis in Washington, the investigation of the president, what do you think? What I think it's a bad thing for the country. I mean, uh, it's doing damage to the office of the president. It's doing damage to America's image globally. It may have a national security implications. It's not a good thing. Well, let's stop there. What, what are the national security implications? Well, if the American president is weak or is weakened by extraneous um, difficulties, then people who don't like America figure, well, maybe there's, here's an opportunity for us to do something that he won't have time to deal with or he'll be too distracted to deal with it effectively. Mm. So, I mean, who are the villains for you in this thing? Oh, terrorists, uh, any, any a foreign government that has interests contrary to our own. Do you, how vulnerable, do, wh when you look at the national security interests of the country, where is our most vulnerable point? I assume it's terrorism of some kind. Oh, I, I, terrorism, which is not so much a national security as a police um, uh, problem. I mean, it, it, in the way the government operates now, the FBI is the principal counter-terror agency, not, not the military. Uh, and the FBI has been quite effective at dealing with terrorism, probably more effective than, than any police agency in the world. Uh, but, I mean... And, and when, when they're successful, we rarely... Exactly. And when, when, when it's successful, a guy quietly goes to, to prison, and when it's unsuccessful, somebody blows up a building in Oklahoma. It's awfully hard to, to prevent, you know, the one madman, as, as you know, the Timothy McVeigh was in Oklahoma, or you know, the, the screwballs did the World Trade Center here in New York. But then... You know, Jimmy Fox, who ran the New York field office, had those guys in, in custody in, what, three, four days. Yeah, which forgot was what the break good. was there. I've forgotten what the break was. Well, they, they, went, they went back to collect the deposit on the oh, truck. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, which is, kind of a mistake. Which is happen. illustrative of the fact that the, ter the average terrorist isn't smart. I mean, smart terrorists go to law school. You know, it's uh, that sort of situation. Uh, terrorism is a potential problem, but... In this, we don't have a national security threat today in the same sense we had it 10 years ago. When 10 years ago, there was this country called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics that had 10,000 warheads aimed at us, and that was a big deal. That could have you know, destroyed America as, as, a, as, a, as a culture, as a country. That, 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 that's not there anymore. And you know, the, the, the threats we have today, while vicious, are relatively minor. And okay, so, so you know, okay, they kill off 20 or 30 people. That's a bad thing. But is it important to the country as a whole? Not really, except in an aesthetic sense. In, in terms of physical security, that's, that's a minor threat, not a major threat. When you look at people like Iraq, the Iraqis, the Iranians, mm -hmm. the Libyans, uh, what in some cases they're called rogue states, give us a track one or more, uh, mm -hmm. North Korea perhaps. Uh, don't you worry, or do you worry that these, that they are near developing atomic weapons and that therefore uh, the potential of somebody uh, who sees the world differently than sane and reasonable people might use it? That's a possibility. I mean, with India and Pakistan, uh, that's they're a problem. rogue states, uh, but they're, they're... Well, by our standards, they are. Uh, the, the press didn't report that at least two of the Pakistani detonations were, were duds. They were fizzles. They didn't go off. Yeah. And I think something happened to the Iranian missile at the end. And... Yeah, it could be. Uh, the, f the fact of the matter is that uh, were those countries to, to target the United States, the consequences would be very severe for the countries launching the attack. I mean, if, if, if Iraq, for example, had set off a nuclear device in the United States, the next day Baghdad turns into a parking lot. Same thing would be true of India or, or, or Pakistan, and they know that. And people, you know, Saddam Hussein, you know, he, he's a dictator, and, and dictatorship is a business without a pension plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't retire from being a dictator, you, you die. And as, as any normal, rational person, he wants to be alive as long as possible. So he's not going to do something that, that's going to threaten his, his own life. Well, he did something by invading Kuwait that threatened his own life. I mean, he's damn lucky that uh, you know, he was lucky. Pulled than, up when he, they he did. He was luckier than you know because we, we did make several determined attempts to get him. And all, unfortunately, they all miscarried. What happened? He was lucky. I mean, what happened? Why why did they miscarry? Um, co combination of luck and, and fundamental difficulty in in getting a guy like that who's you know. People have been trying to kill Saddam Hussein for 40 years. Yeah. He's the reason he's alive is he he knows a, quite a few interesting and actually fer fairly simple tricks for keeping himself alive. Like he sleeps in different places. He exactly. Has people he, that he he, knows. Nobody, nobody knows where he's going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And he has doubles all over the place. Yeah, we and and supposedly we got one or two of his doubles. Oh, we killed thinking that it was him. Yeah. 
uh, or as one of my my friends once said, well, what if we got him, and then the double went to Look his, over. and and then the the double went to his kids and said, well, it's like this guy's. If you admit your father is dead, then you're dead. On the other hand, if you say I'm your father, then you're alive. What are you going to do? And so, what if there's a double running Iraq right now? Probably not. But it's it's kind of an amusing uh, proposition. So you know, killing people like that is a lot more difficult. It's it's not like TV or the movies, and CIA does not have a great deal of expertise in killing people because the CIA does not do that. Well, they it, contract it out. To whom? Well, that's my question. I mean, that was you know, my next question. The yellow question. pages to assassins well, no, 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 no. are us. I, I mean, well, Look, this is not there an are, there Tom, are, this is not an unheard of idea. Think about the effort to get Castro. Uh, yeah, and, and a, a good friend of mine uh, was a government prosecutor, and he was tagged with um, pursuing with the, the stuff developed from the church committee hearings. Mm -hmm. And this this friend of mine, he was before he was a, an attorney with the Justice Department. He was a, an agent with the FBI, and uh, and and he told me once that that he prostrated himself to God every night, saying, "Please, God, don't let this go forward. I don't want the world to know how inept." These guys the, the government was trying. It couldn't find one guy. They couldn't find one shooter to take Castro down. Hmm. Not one competent shooter. The whole government could not find the one guy. Well, see, I find that amazing to me because of the following. I mean, you take what we now know. I mean, I came to know this in the last several years about people who are trained as snipers. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they that good as a shooter? That they because, well, there's more to access than that. is one thing, but being a shooter is not a quite problem. Okay, is it? first of all, you have to identify the target. You have to know where the target is going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you have to get your shooter close to that point, and he has to be set up and ready to take the shot at a precise point in time with an exit strategy. Oh yeah, and he won't, he he probably wants to get out and, and get home to the wife and kids. Uh, first of all, the, the, the fundamental problem is gathering the information. I mean, it's putting troops on the ground, you're putting spooks on the ground and, and finding out where, in this case, Castro is going to be. It's not that easy. Someone once said to me, and I, this, I had no way to test this, that, that the Mossad could have gotten. <laughs> the Mossad uh, is, is, is an organization that, uh, that's been living on its own press clippings for quite a while. Not as good as it's said to be. Nobody's as good as they say Mossad was, and, they, and Mossad has screwed up many times. They screwed well, certainly up a, recently. In, they screwed in, up in, in 1973. Georgia. I mean, you know, the, the, when they, they gave the, the Israeli government like four hours warning that there was a war was going to start, and they're supposed to do a little bit better than four hours. Uh, 1970, you know, the Yom Kippur War, yeah, 1973 well, they was, was very they, bad. They blame the, the military for that too. Well, naturally, they don't. They're not. They didn't take the blame themselves, but they were the principal intelligence uh, gathering agency of, of the Israeli government, and they didn't gather the intelligence, did they? Now, look, these are human institutions, and they have human frailties. Now, if these Israelis could have taken out Saddam Hussein, yeah, maybe, maybe so, but they didn't. And they have reason to do so. The Iranians have reason to do so. The, and the Iranians are co-religionists. I mean, you know, the, Iraq is a majority Shia country, and Iran is a, is, is a Shia, ruled by the, the Shia branch of Islam. Right. And so there's a great, a, you know, a heck of a motivation for Iranians to arrange uh, for the death of Saddam Hussein. They haven't been able to bring it off. Why? I don't know. You tell because me. Because Saddam Hussein is very skilled at keeping himself alive. And he does yeah. it by taking relatively simple steps of not letting people know where he's going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. So the best way to do it, probably, in the end, is you've got to get to somebody who's part of the House Guard. Exactly. That's how I do it in executive orders. Right. And that's how they, Indira yeah. Gandhi was killed by someone who was part of her by own security. By our own protective detail, because right. they were all Sikhs, and she went out of her way to annoy the Sikhs, and they blew they her away in her somebody. own garden. Yeah. And so that's the best way to do it. Yeah, but it's 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 the best way is also the most difficult way. How do you get how do you get to somebody who's yeah, that but close? But look, I mean, okay, so I mean, you're talking <clears throat> about killing a dictator. You're not talking about killing somebody in a democracy, right? Because if you look at all the random assassinations here, whether it's Kennedy and Kennedy or King, and I mean, these these guys seem like crackpots who come out of nowhere. You no, know, that's a typical assassin. It's a screwball. Yeah. yeah. And it's always been that way. But. The reason that we don't do it is because we can't do it. Let's take Saddam. Because we do not have... Even though there's a national policy against it. The reason we don't do it, oh, first of all, it's an executive order exactly. promulgated by President Ford back in the 1970s, which is, which is the rule, but, but any president can just say, draft me a new yeah. one, as Jack yeah. does in executive orders. Yeah. Uh, you have to, once you decide you want to do it, you develop the political will to do it, then you have to have the training and the, and the equipment and the right people 
to make something like that happen. That's, these are not trivial exercises. These are difficult things to do. Hmm. Who's the best military strategist ever to uh, work for the, to, ever to serve in the United States Armed Services? MacArthur? I, I'd say MacArthur, yeah. Although, if you go back to the Civil War, you know, William Tecumseh Sherman was a superb operational commander. Or for that matter, George, you know, the, the Dave Palmer used to be commandant up at, the, up at West Point, wrote a book about George Washington as a strategist, and said he was pretty good. I mean, but, There's a know, new book about Grant called, I think, Ulysses Grant Reconsidered. Uh, Grant was, I mean, he won. Number one, he won. And that's what you pay generals to do is win. Uh, he was in effect, he, you know, he, he, he won the war, and that's, that's what they paid him for, and so you, you have to put him up high up on the list. As good as other generals were fa failing at the same task. Oh, yeah. And, McClellan and the rest of them. Well, McClellan, you know, he wasn't a general. He was a sort of a drill, drill instructor. <laughs> no, what was it Lincoln said to McClellan? Uh, general McClellan, if you don't plan to use that army, give it to me. And no, lend it to me. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, I'd say the consensus would be Douglas MacArthur uh, for, for a number of reasons. Number, I mean, his accomplishments in the field were extraordinary. And, but more than that, Here's a guy who, who was born on a cavalry post in, the, what, the 1880s, and where, when the high-tech was a, was a lever-action Winchester 73 rifle, and at the, end of his, uh, at, at the end of his tenure in the military, he had nuclear weapons and jet aircraft under his control. I mean, that's an enormous leap of technology and, 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 and capabilities, and he assimilated all of it. This is also a guy who, when he went to West Point, his mother went up there to live with him. Well, things were different back then. You know. <laughs> what do you mean they would? And he was first captain. Yeah, he was first captain of the corps. I mean, he, he was, was he was number one guy in his class, and he was he had he had the you know he was on the he crazy both, side I of think. Wasn't he both the uh, number one academically and also number one in terms of captain? Uh, yeah, of the corps? yeah. He was he he did everything he could have yeah. done could possibly have done. He How had the, he had the courage of a lion. I mean, he was on the crazy side of brave. He was always exposing himself to danger because he was one of these guys that thought, you know, they haven't made the bullet that's going to kill me. And there are a lot of people who think that way, but most of them get dead as lieutenants. Uh, Charles de Gaulle was like that, uh, and, and, and a few other people. They, they're just, they just don't believe they can be harmed, so they're always doing foolish things. Uh, so MacArthur was physically, you know, immensely courageous. Who had the largest ego, Patton or MacArthur? Uh, you don't get to be a general without having a MacArthur. capacious ego. And, and, but to put the two of them in a, in a room, you'd probably end up with a fist fight. I mean, you know... <laughs> The, you know, no, no one time zone is big enough for those two guys. They were both superb commanders. In terms of those who fought against the United States, Rommel, maybe? Oh, God. Um, Albert Kesselring, the, the German commander in Italy, was very yeah. effective. Rommel was a, was a fine operational commander. Uh, Gerd von Lundstedt was mm. pretty good as well. The Germans... Turned a lot of good operational commanders, but you know, as as, a, as an American general, uh, William Dupay wrote, wrote in the, back in the 1970s, why do we study the German German army so much? They haven't won a war in a hundred years. And I read that and I thought, well, yeah, actually, that's true. <laughs> you know, uh, well, the, but then who should we be studying? Everybody, Napoleon, Frederick the Great, uh, Wellington. You, you study everybody. You know, the funny thing about yeah, but Napoleon, Napoleon lost at Waterloo. Uh, true. He, he, he won in a lot of other places. Um, he didn't win in Moscow. I got awfully cold. <laughs> no, you study everything. You, if, if you get into a, a, a historical discussion with any general in the army, uh, you, you all of a sudden you're, you find yourself in the receiving end of a two-hour lecture yeah. that goes all the way back to Alexander the Great and forward from there. And then he says, and that's why we deploy tanks the way we do, because of all this you know, 2,000 years of accumulated military experience. That's where that's the way these generals study military history. Every general we have in the army is a, is a very serious professional historian. When you go to lecture, uh, either at at some military training school, some uh, officers training, or FBI academy. Now, last year I spoke at the Air War College in Alabama. Okay, the War yeah. College. So, what do you talk about? I mean, what's Clancy there for? Oh, a historical overview, and then a look at the, into the future, and I you know, propose yeah. changes in in, in, in the future. At, at Maxwell Air Force Base, I, at the Air War College, I proposed assassination as an instrument of policy, as I showed, as I executed in, in executive orders, uh, where, uh, you know, I say the logical extension <coughs> of stealth aircraft and precision guided munitions is, is targeting the enemy chief of state from the first day of the war, hmm. because uh, it's the only thing that's really morally defensible. 
uh, it took, we had to kill six million Germans to get to Adolf Hitler. Right. If we'd been able to take Hitler out on the first day, we would have saved a hell of a lot of lives. Sure, Not of just Germans, but Americans and, and, and Jews and Poles and, and Russians you could as also, well. And you could also argue that if, in fact, there was, I mean, if, in fact, one of the American bombs in the Vietnam War had taken out Ho Chi Minh, nobody would have shed one single tear. Right? Yeah, particularly, up, well, Vonoy and Jap, I think, would be the guy you really wanted to well, kill. Well, Jap would be better. That's right, the military commander. We get them both in the same but room. Just fine. take military commander, yeah. Jap. Okay. Um, and yet, at the same time, I mean, if we send in someone, well, that's war, so that's different, I guess. You could argue different. But, I mean, we would have had no tear shed if, if some, uh, some missile had taken out Saddam Hussein, would we? I don't think anybody would have cried very much you know, about it. Whereas, very few whereas it would have been against national policy to send a... Uh, a shooter in that to try to take him out, wouldn't it? Well, the way you, the way I propose to do it is you put somebody in on the ground with a laser designator, and because you don't have to get very close to use one of those, and then when you I, when you know where the guy is, just put a laser spot on his bedroom window, and an F-117 flies overhead and drops two GBU-25s through the window, and it can find the laser spot. Oh yeah, that works. That that that, that technology does work. I've put it in several of my yeah, you know, I put it in my first book like nine years ago. So the technology is there. Just a matter of putting, you know, knowing where the guy is and putting a laser spot on that on that location, and the bomb will find the spot. Did they try that? And in... no. What, did you recommend it by then? I mean, when was I've forgotten when uh, executive was, order was? Uh, more in executive orders, it was more recent than that. Can it be done? Yeah. Do, are, do we do it? No. Why? First of all, is the executive order promulgated by President Ford? And secondly, because we haven't thought about it. And before you, you know, once you decide to do something, you have to train people to do it and give them the equipment and, and the support they need to accomplish the mission. When you look at, where does it all come from for you, which is an inevitable question from you? Is it reading? Is it conversation? All is of the it above. The, the interviews? Yeah. I talk with people, we kick ideas around, and I do a little thinking and analysis on my own. So there, I mean, in a sense, you were constantly in search of. I got a friend uh, he just retired from the FBI. His last job was down in Dallas, and I called down there to talk to him once. And I got his secretary. He was on the phone. I was talking yeah. to his secretary. She goes, "You know what the boss says about you?" He says, "He's a sponge. He's going to remember everything you say. He's a sponge." <laughs> well, I'm a sponge, and I absorb. I'm always at work, and I'm always absorbing information. And that's, yeah. that's that's who I am. But you're also fascinated by motivation and, and how what makes people tick oh, yeah, and, and that yeah. kind of sense of, of and, how and, they and, make decisions. And for the, most part, and for the and most part, the people I write about, they're, they're motivated by the same thing. They love of country. Uh, they're, they're people who, who prefer order to chaos and try to bring order out of chaos. Mm. You know, people who try to do the right thing. And people who want to win. Yep. Great to see you again. Good to be back, Tom. Tom Clancy, Rainbow Six, John Clark stars... Um, leading a fight against eco-terrorism. Back in a moment, stay with us.